<coughs> Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jan. So, uh, no, it's really great to be here, and thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, so yes, uh, robot intelligence. Um, so I've titled the, the lecture The Thinking Robot, uh, but of course that immediately begs the question, what on earth do we mean by thinking? Uh, well, we could of course spend the whole of the next hour you know, debating what we mean by thinking, but, um, but I should say that I'm particularly interested in, um, and will focus on, uh, on embodied intelligence. So in other words, the kind of intelligence that, that, you know, that we have, that, that, that animals, including humans, have, and that robots have. So of course, you know, that, that kind of slightly differentiates what I'm talking about from AI, but, but I regard robotics as a kind of subset of, of AI. Um, and of course, one of the things that, that uh, we've discovered in the last 60 odd years of artificial intelligence is that the things that we thought were really difficult actually are relatively easy, like you know, playing chess or Go for that matter. Um, whereas the things that we thought were really difficult, sorry, we originally thought were really easy, like making a cup of tea, uh, are really hard. So, so it's kind of the opposite of what was expected. Uh, so embodied in intelligence in the real world is, is, is really very difficult indeed. Um, and that's what I'm interested in. So this is the kind of outline of the, uh, of the uh, talk. Um, I'm going to talk initially about intelligence and, and offer some uh, ideas, if you like, for uh, w a way of thinking about intelligence and breaking it down into categories or, or, or types of, of intelligence. And then I'm going to choose a particular one, which I'm, uh, I've been really working on the last, uh, last three or four years. Um, uh, and that is, uh, it's what I call a generic architecture for a functional imagination. Um, or in short, uh, robots with internal models. So that's really what I want, I want to focus on. Uh, because I really wanted to show you some experimental work that we've done in the last couple of years in the lab. Um, I mean, I'm a, an electronics engineer. I'm an experimentalist, and uh, so doing experiments is really important for me. So the first thing that, that um, you know, we ought to realize, I'm sure we do realize, uh, is that intelligence is not one thing that we all, you know, animals, humans, and robots have more or less of. Absolutely not. And, you know, there are several ways of breaking intelligence down into different kind of categories, if you like, of intelligence, different types of intelligence. And here's one that I came up with uh, in the last couple of years. Um, it's certainly not the only way of thinking about intelligence, but this really breaks intelligence into four, if you like, types, four kinds of intelligence. Um, you could say kinds of minds, um, I, I guess. Um, the, the most fundamental is what we call morphological intelligence. And that's the intelligence that you get just from having a physical body. Um, uh, and you know, there are some interesting questions about uh, how you design morphological intelligence. You've probably all seen pictures of, uh, or, or movies of robots that, that can walk, but in fact don't actually have any computing, any computation whatsoever. You know, in other words, the, 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 the uh, behavior of, of walking uh, is an emergent property of the mechanics, if you like, the springs and, and levers and so on in the robot. So that's an example of morphological intelligence. Uh, individual intelligence is, is the kind of intelligence that, that you get from learning individually. Social intelligence, I think, is really interesting and important, and that's the one that I'm going to focus on most in this talk. Social intelligence is the intelligence that you get from um, uh, learning socially from, from each other. Uh, and of course, we are a social species. And the other one, which I've been working on a lot in the last, uh, well, 20 odd years, is swarm intelligence. So this is the kind of intelligence uh, that we see in, uh, most particularly in social animals, uh, insects, where, the, um, where the, the most interesting properties of swarm intelligence tend to be emergent or self-organizing. So in other words, the, the intelligence is typically manifest uh, as a collective behavior that emerges from the, if you like, the micro-interactions between the individuals in that population. 
So emergence and self-organization, particularly interesting to me. But um, I said this is, this is absolutely you know, not the only way to think about intelligence. And, um, and I'm going to show you an, another way of thinking about intelligence, which I particularly like. And this is um, Dan Dennett's Tower of Generate and Test. So in uh, Darwin's Dangerous Idea and, and several other books, I think, uh, Dan Dennett uh, s suggests that, that a good way of thinking about intelligence is to think about the fact that um, all animals, including ourselves, need to decide what actions to take. You know, so choosing the next action is really critically important. It, I mean, it, it's, 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 it's critically important for, for all of us including humans, uh, even though the wrong action may not kill us, as it were, as humans. But for many animals, the wrong action may well kill that animal. And, uh, and so Dennett talks about um, what he calls the tower of generate and test, which I want to show you here. It's, it's a really cool uh, kind of breakdown, if you like, way of thinking about intelligence. So at the bottom of his tower are Darwinian creatures. And the thing about da Darwinian creatures is that they have only one way of, uh, as it were, um, learning from, uh, or if you like, generating and testing next possible actions, and that is um, natural selection. So Darwinian creatures in his uh, schema uh, cannot learn. They can only try out an action. If it kills them, well, that's the end of that, you know, so, so that you know, by the laws of natural selection, that particular action is unlikely to be passed on to, uh, to um, descendants. Now, of course, all animals on the planet are Darwinian creatures, including ourselves, but a subset are what Dennett calls Skinnerian creatures. So Skinnerian creatures are able to um, generate a, a next possible, a candidate action, if you like, a next possible action, and try it out. Uh, and, and here's the thing, if it doesn't kill them, but it's, but it's actually a bad action, then they'll learn from that. Or even if it's a good action, a Skinnerian creature will learn from trying out an action. So really, uh, Skinnerian creatures um, are a subset of Darwinians, actually a small subset, uh, that are able to learn by trial and error, individually learn by trial and error. Now, the third layer in um, or story, if you like, in Dennett's Tower, he calls Popperian creatures after, obviously, the, the philosopher Karl Popper. And Popperian creatures have a big advantage over Darwinians and Skinnerians in that they have an internal model of themselves and the world. And with an internal model, it means that you can try out an action, a candidate next possible action, uh, if you like, by imagining it, um, and it means that you don't have actually have to put yourself to the risk of, of trying it out for real physically in the world and, you know, um, possibly it killing you or at least harming you. So Popperian creatures have this amazing invention, um, which is internal modelling. And of course, we are examples of Popperian creatures. Uh, but there are plenty of other animals. Uh, not, again, it's not, not, not a huge proportion. Uh, it's rather a small proportion, in fact, of all animals, but certainly there are plenty of animals that, that are capable in some form of modelling their world and, as it were, imagining actions before trying them out. And just to complete Dennett's tower, he adds a, a, another layer uh, w that he calls uh, Gregorian creatures. This, here he's naming this layer after Richard Gregory, the, 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 uh, uh, the British psychologist. Um, and the thing that uh, Gregorian creatures have is that in addition to internal models, uh, they have mind tools like language and mathematics, uh, especially language, because it means that uh, 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 Gregorian creatures can uh, share their experiences. In fact, a Gregorian creature could, for instance, uh, model uh, in, its, in its brain, uh, in its mind, uh, uh, the... Uh, the possible consequences of doing a particular thing and then actually pass that knowledge to you. So you don't even have to model it yourself. So, uh, so uh, Gregorian creatures uh, really have 
the kind of social intelligence that, that, that we probably, perhaps not uniquely, uh, but there are obviously only a handful of species that, that are able to uh, communicate, you know, uh, um, if you like, traditions uh, with each other. So, um, so I think internal models are really, really interesting. And as I say, I've been spending the last couple of years uh, thinking about robots with internal models um, and, and actually doing experiments with, with robots with internal models. So are um, <coughs> robots with internal models self-aware? Well, probably not in the sense that, you know, the everyday sense that we mean by self-aware sentient. But certainly internal models, I think, can provide a minimal level of kind of functional self-awareness and absolutely enough to allow us to ask uh, what-if questions. So with internal models, uh, we have potentially a really powerful technique for robots because it means that they can actually um, ask themselves questions about what if I take this or that next possible action. So there's the action selection, if you like. Um, so, uh, so really, you know, I'm kind of following Dennett's model. Um, I'm really interested in building Popperian creatures. Actually, I'm interested in bu building Gregorian creatures, but that's another, if you like, another step uh, in, the, uh, in the story. So really here I'm focusing primarily on Popperian creatures, so robots with internal models. And so, and what I'm talking about in particular uh, is uh, a robot with a simulation of itself and its currently perceived environment and other actors inside itself. So it, it, it takes a bit of getting your head around, the idea of a robot with a simulation of itself inside itself. But that's really what I'm talking about. Uh, and um, the famous, the late John Holland, for instance, rather um, uh, uh, you know, perceptively wrote an internal model allows a system to look ahead to the future consequences of actions without committing itself to those actions. I don't know whether Holland, John Holland was um, aware of, of Dennett's tower, possibly not, but, but really saying the same kind of thing as Dan Dennett. Now, before I give you, um, before I come on to the work that I've been doing, I want to show you some examples of, um, a few examples, there aren't many in fact, uh, of robots with uh, with self-simulation. Uh, the, the first one, uh, as, as far as I'm aware, was by Richard Vaughan and his team, uh, and he used a simulation inside a robot to allow it to plan uh, a safe route um, with incomplete knowledge. Uh, so as far as I'm, I'm aware, this is the, the world's first example of robots with uh, self-simulation. Um, Perhaps uh, an example that you might already be familiar with, this is Josh Bongard and Hod Lipson's work. Um, very notable, very interesting work uh, here. Self-simulation, but for a different purpose. So this is not self-simulation to choose, as it were, gross actions in the world, but instead self-simulation to learn how to control your own body. So that the idea here is that if you have a complex body, uh, then uh, a self-simulation is a really good way of figuring out how to control yourself, including how to repair yourself if parts of you should, should break or fail uh, or, or, um, or be damaged, for instance. So that's a, a really interesting um, example of, of what you can do with self-simulation. And a similar idea really was, uh, was um, tested by my old friend Owen Holland. Um, he built this kind of scary-looking robot uh, initially, it was called Kronos, but, but then it became known as Eche Robot. Um, and this robot is deliberately um, designed to be hard to control. In fact, he, Owen uh, refers to it as anthropomimi anthropomimetic, which means anthropic from the inside out. So most humanoid robots are only you know, humanoid on the outside, uh, but here we have a robot that has uh, a skeletal structure it has tendons, it, it, it's, it's very, and you can see from the little movie clip there, uh, if any part of the robot moves, then the whole of the rest of the mobot, robot, um, as it were, tends to, to, to flex, uh, rather like you know, human bodies or animal bodies. So um, 
Owen was particularly interested in uh, a robot that is difficult to control and the idea then of using uh, an internal simulation of yourself in order to, to be able to control yourself or learn to control yourself. And um, he uh, was the first to come up with this, this uh, phrase, functional imagination. Really interesting work, so do check that out. Um. And the final example I want to give you uh, is uh, from my own lab um, where uh, this is swarm robotics work where we've in fact uh, we, we're doing evolutionary swarm robotics here uh, and uh, we've put a simulation of each robot and the swarm inside each robot and in fact we're using those internal simulations as part of a genetic algorithm so each robot in fact is evolving its own controller um, and in fact it, it, it actually updates its own controller about once a second. So it's, it's a, again, it's a bit an, of, of an odd thing to get your head around. So about once a second, uh, each robot uh, becomes its own great, 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 great grandchild. In other words, its controller is um, a descendant. Um, but the problem with, with, uh, with this is that the internal simulation tends to be wrong and we have what we call the reality gap, so the gap between the simulation and the real world. And so we got round that, my student Paul O'Dowd came up with the idea that we could co-evolve the simulators um, as well as the controllers in the robots. So, so you have a population of robots um, inside each individual physical robot, uh, as it were simulated robots, but then you also have um, a swarm of, of 10 robots and therefore we have a population of 10 simulators so, so we, we actually co-evolve here the simulators and the, the robot controllers. So um, I want to now show you the, the newer work I've been doing on uh, robots with internal models. And primarily, um, I, was, I was telling uh, Jan earlier that, that um, uh, you know, I'm a kind of old-fashioned electronics engineer, spent much of my career uh, building safety systems, safety critical systems. So safety is something that's very important to me and to robotics. So here's a, a kind of generic internal modeling architecture for safety. So uh, the, the, this is in fact Dennett's um, loop of generate and test. So the idea is that we have an internal model which is a self simulation uh, that is initialized to match the current real world um, and then uh, you try out, you, you run the simulator for, for each of your next possible actions. I mean, to, 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 to put it very simply, imagine that, that you're a robot and you could either turn left, turn right, go straight ahead or stand still. So you have four possible next actions. And therefore you'd loop through this uh, internal model for each of those next possible actions and then moderate the action selection mechanism in your controller. So this is not part of the controller, it's a kind of moderator, if you like. So you could imagine um, that the, the regular robot controller, the thing in red, uh, has uh, a set of four next possible actions, uh, but your, uh, your internal model determines that, that only two of them are safe. Uh, so it would effectively, uh, if you like, moderate or govern the, the, the action selection mechanism of the robot's controller uh, so that the robot controller, uh, in fact, uh, will not choose the unsafe actions. Interestingly, um, if you have a, a, a learning controller, then that's fine because we can effectively uh, extend or copy the, uh, the learned behaviors into the internal model. That's, that's fine. So. In principle, we haven't done this, but, but we're starting to do it now. In principle, we can uh, extend this architecture to, uh, as it were, to, to adaptive or learning robots. So, um, I mean, here's a, a, a simple thought experiment. Imagine a robot with several safety hazards uh, facing it. Um, it has four next possible actions. Well, uh, your internal model uh, can, um, as it were, figure out what the consequence of each of those actions uh, might be. So, so uh, two of them, so either uh, turn right 
uh, or stay still uh, are safe actions. So that's a very simple thought experiment. And, uh, and here's a slightly more complicated experiment, thought experiment. So imagine that the robot, there's another actor in the environment, it's a human. Uh, the human is, is not looking where they're going, perhaps walking down the street, peering at a smartphone. That never happens, does it, of course? And, um, uh, and about to walk into a hole in the pavement. Well, um, of course, if it were you uh, noticing that, that human about to walk into a hole in the pavement, you would almost certainly intervene, of course. And it's not just because you're a good person. It's because you have the cognitive machinery to predict the consequences of both your and their actions. And you can figure out that if you were to rush over towards them, uh, you might be able to prevent them from falling into the hole. So here's the same kind of idea, um, but with a robot. Imagine it's not you, but a robot. And imagine now that um, you are modeling the consequences of yours and the human's actions for each one of your next possible actions. And um, you can see that now this time we've given a kind of numerical scale. So uh, zero is perfectly safe, whereas 10 is uh, seriously dangerous, you know, kind of danger of death, if you like. Um, and you can see that um, the safest outcome is if the robot turns right. In other words, the safest for the human, I mean, clearly the safest for the robot is either turn left or stay still. But in both cases, uh, the, the human would, would fall into the hole. So you can see that we could actually invent a rule uh, which would represent, you know, the, as it were, the, the best outcome for the human. And this is what it looks like. So if for all robot actions the human is equally safe, then that means that we don't need to worry about the human. So we'll just output uh, the, the internal model will output uh, the, the safest actions for the robot. Else, then output the actions, the robot actions, for the least unsafe human outcomes. Now, <coughs> remarkably, and we didn't intend this, this actually is an implementation of, of Asimov's first law of robotics. So, um, a robot may not injure a human being all through inaction. That's important, the all through inaction allow a human being to, uh, to come to harm. So we kind of ended up, uh, if you like, building an Asimovian robot, simple Asimovian ethical robot. So um, what does it look like? Well, we started, uh, we've now extended to humanoid robots, but we started with the EPUC robots, these little um, uh, kind of, they're about the size of a, of a salt shaker, I guess, um, about seven centimeters tall. Um, and this is the, uh, the little arena in the lab. And what we actually have inside the, the ethical robot uh, is, is, this is the, as it were, the internal architecture. So, uh, so you can see that we have um, the robot controller, which is in fact a mirror of the real robot controller. Um, a model of the robot and a model of the world, which includes you know, others in the world. So this is the simulator. This is, this is a, more or less a regular robot simulator. So you, you probably know that robot simulators are quite commonplace. You know, we roboticists use them all the time to, to test robots, you know, in, as it were, in the virtual world before then trying out the code for real. But what we've done here is we've actually put it, as it happens, an off-the-shelf simulator inside the robot and made it work in real time. So the output of the, of the simulator for each of those next possible actions is evaluated and then um, goes through a, 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 a logic layer, which is essentially the, the rule, the, the if-then-else rule that I showed you a couple of slides ago. Um, and that effectively determines or, or moderates the action selection uh, mechanism of the real uh, robot. So, um, so this is the simulation budget. So we're actually using the, the open source uh, simulator stage, a well-known uh, uh, simulator. And in fact, we managed to get stage to run about 600 times real time, uh, which means that we're actually uh, cycling through our internal model twice a second. And for each one of those um, cycles, 
we're actually modelling not four, but 30 next possible actions. And we're modelling about 10 seconds into the future. So every half a second, our, our robot with an internal model is looking ahead um, uh, 10 seconds for about 30 next possible actions, 30 of its own next possible actions. But of course, it's also modelling the consequences of, of each of the other actors, dynamic actors in its environment. So, you know, this is quite nice to actually do this in real time. Um, and, and let me show you some of the results that we got from that. So, ignore the, the kind of football pitch. So, what we have here is uh, the ethical robot, which we call the A robot after Asimov. Um, and we have a hole in the ground. It's not a real hole, it's a virtual hole in the ground. We don't want to be digging holes into the lab floor. And <coughs> we're using another EPUC uh, as a proxy human. We call this the H robot. Um, so let me show you what happened. Well, we ran it, first of all, with, um, uh, with no H robot at all as a kind of baseline, if you like. And you can see on the left, uh, in 26 runs, those are the traces of the A robot. So you can see the A robot, in fact, is maintaining its own safety. It's, it's avoiding, it's skirting around the edge, almost optimally skirting the, the edge of the hole in the ground. But then when we introduce the H robot, you get this wonderful um, behavior here where as soon as the A robot notices that the H robot is heading towards the hole, which is about here, then it deflects, it, it, it diverts from its original course. Um, and uh, in fact, more or less collides. They don't actually physically collide because they have low level collision avoidance. So they don't actually collide, but nevertheless, uh, the A robot effectively heads off the H robot that then bounces off um, and safely, as it were, goes off in a, another direction. And the A robot then resumes its course uh, to its target position. So, uh, which is really nice. Um, and, you know, interestingly, uh, even though our simulator is rather low fidelity, it doesn't matter. You know, surprisingly, it doesn't matter because the closer the A robot to the H robot gets, then the better are its predictions about colliding. So this is, this is why, even with a rather low fidelity simulator, we can collide with really uh, good uh, precision uh, with the H robot. So let me show you the movies uh, of this trial <coughs> uh, with a single uh, uh, proxy human. And I think the movie starts uh, in, uh, so this is real time. Um, and you can see the, the A robot nicely heading off the H robot, which then disappears off towards the left. Um, I think then we, we've speeded up four times, and, and uh, this is a whole load of runs. So you can see that it really does work. Um, and also notice that every experiment is a bit different. And of course, that's what typically happens when you have real physical robots. Because that simply because of the noise uh, in the system, the fact that these are real robots with imperfect motors and sensors and what have you. So um, we <coughs> we um, <coughs> wrote the paper and were about to submit the paper when, you know, we kind of thought, well, this is a bit boring, isn't it? You know, <coughs> we built this robot <coughs> and it works. So we had the idea to put a second human in the Oh, uh, ah, no, I, I've, sorry, I've forgotten one slide. So before I get to that, I just wanted to show you <coughs> um, a little uh, animation of these little filaments here are the traces of the, the A robot and its um, prediction of what might happen. So at the point where this turns red, the A robot then starts to intercept, and each one of those little traces uh, is its prediction of the consequences of both itself and the and the H robot. Uh, this is really nice because you can kind of look into the, if you, if you like, look into the, um, <coughs> the mind, to put it that way, uh, of the robot and actually see what it's doing, which is very nice, very cool. But I was about to say uh, we tried the same experiment, in fact, identical code, 
with two H robots. And this is the robot's dilemma. Uh, this may be the first time that a, a real physical robot has faced a, an ethical dilemma. <laughs> so you can see the two H robots are more or less equidistant from the hole. And the, there is the A robot, which in fact fails to save either of them. <laughs> so what's going on there? Um, we know that it can save one of them all of every time, but in fact it's just failed to save either. Um, and, oh yeah, it does actually save one of them and has a look at the other one, but it's too late. <laughs> so um, this is really very interesting uh, and not at all what we expected. <laughs> in fact, the, let me show you the statistics. So in um, 33 runs, um, the, uh, the, the ethical robot failed to save either of the uh, H robots just under half the time. So about 14 times it failed to save uh, either. It, it saved one of them. Uh, just over 15, perhaps 16 times, but, and amazingly saved both of them twice, which is quite surprising. Uh, it really should perform better than that. Um, so, you know, uh, and in fact, <coughs> we, when we started to really look at this, we, we discovered that the... So here's a particularly good example of dithering. So uh, we realised that, that, that we made a, a sort of pathologically indecisive ethical robot. <laughs> so I'm going to save this one. Oh, no, no, that one. Oh, no, no, this one, that one. <laughs> and of course, by the time <laughs> our ethical robot has changed its mind three or four times, well, it's too late. So this is the problem. The problem fundamentally is that um, our ethical robot um, doesn't make a decision and stick to it. Um, in fact, it's a consequence of the fact that uh, we are running our consequence engine, as I mentioned, twice a second. So every half a second, our ethical robot has the opportunity to change its mind. That's clearly a bad strategy, but, but nevertheless, it was an interesting um, kind of un unexpected consequence of, of the experiment. Um, we've now transferred the work to these humanoid robots, and we get the same thing. So here there are two, uh, the two red robots both heading toward <laughs> danger. The blue one, the ethical robot, uh, changes its mind and goes and saves the one on the left, even though it could have saved the one on the right. So uh, a, another example of, of um, our dithering ethical robot. And as I've just kind of uh, hinted at, the reason that our ethical robot is so indecisive is because it's es essentially a, a memoryless architecture. So you could, you could say that the, the robot has a, you know, I've again borrowing Owen Holland's uh, description, it has a functional imagination, uh, but it has no autobiographical memory, so it, it doesn't remember the decision it made half a second ago, uh, which is clearly not a good strategy. Uh, you know, uh, uh, really, an ethical robot, uh, just like you, uh, if you are acting uh, in a similar situation, it's probably a good idea to st to for you to stick to the first decision that you made but probably not forever. So, it, you know, I think the decisions probably need to be sticky somehow. So decisions like this may need a half-life. Um, you know, sticky but not, but not absolutely rigid. So, so, but, you know, actually at this point we decided that we're not going to worry too much about this problem because in a sense this is more of a problem for ethicists than, than engineers, perhaps. I don't know, but maybe we could talk about that. I really, before finishing, I want to show you um, another experiment that we did with the same architecture, exactly the same architecture, and this is what we call the corridor experiment. So here we have um, a robot with this internal model, and it has to get from the left hand to the right hand of a crowded corridor without bumping into any of the other robots uh, that are in the same corridor. So imagine you're walking down a you know, a corridor in an airport, and everybody else is coming in the opposite direction, and you, you want to try and get to the other end of the corridor without crashing into any of them. But in fact, 
you have a rather large body space. You, you, know, you don't want to get even close to any of them, so you, you, know, you want to uh, maintain your, as it were, private body space. And uh, what the, our blue robot here is doing is in fact modeling the consequences of its actions and the other ones within this uh, radius of attention. So this blue circle is a radius of attention. So here, we've, here we're looking at, uh, if you like, a simple attention mechanism, which is only worry about the other dynamic actors within your radius of attention. Uh, in fact, we don't even worry about the ones that are behind us. It's only the ones that are more or less in front of us. And you can see that our uh, robot does eventually uh, make it to the end of the corridor, but, but with lots of, of, of kind of stops and, and backtracks in order to prevent it from, because it's really frightened of, of, of any kind of contact with the other robots. Um, uh, and... And, and here we're not showing all of the, the, the sort of filaments of, of prediction, only the, the, the ones that are chosen. Um, so, uh, and here are some results uh, which uh, interestingly show us, so we, uh, perhaps the, the best one to look at, look at is this danger ratio. Um, and uh, dumb simply means robots with no uh, internal model at all, and uh, in intelligent means robots with internal models. So, so here uh, the danger ratio is the is the number of times that you actually come close to another robot. And of course, it's very high. Uh, this is sim is simulated and real robots. Very good correlation between the real and simulated. And with with the intelligent robot, the robot with the internal model, we get a really very much safer performance. Clearly, there is uh, some cost in the sense that, um, uh, for instance, the, the intelligent robot that runs with internal models tend to cover more ground, but surprisingly not that much further distance. Uh, it's less than you'd expect. And clearly, there's a computational cost, uh, because the computational cost of simulating clearly is zero for the dumb robots, whereas it's, as it's quite high for the uh, the intelligent robot, the robot with internal models. But, but again, you know, computation is relatively free these days, so actually we're trading safety for computation, which I think is a good, a good trade-off. So, um, so really I want to con conclude there. Um, you know, I've not, of course, talked about all aspects of robot intelligence. That would be a three-hour seminar, and even then I, you know, I wouldn't be able to cover it all. Uh, but what I hope I've shown you uh, in the last few minutes is that with internal models, we have um, a very powerful generic architecture, which we could call um, a functional imagination. And, you know, this is where I'm being a little bit speculative. Perhaps this moves us in the direction of artificial theory of mind, perhaps even self-awareness. I'm not going to use the word machine consciousness. Well, I just have, but, but that's <laughs> a very much... Uh, 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 more difficult goal, I think. And, and I think there is practical value. I think there's real practical value in robotics of um, robots with self and other simulation. Because as I've, I think, I I've, hope I've demonstrated, at least in a kind of prototype sense, proof of concept, uh, that such simulation moves us towards uh, safer and possibly ethical systems in unpredictable environments. Um, with other dynamic actors. So thank you very much indeed for listening. I'd obviously be delighted to, uh, to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very fascinating view on robotics today. Uh, we have time for questions. Uh, please wait until you got a microphone so we have the answer also on the video. Um, the game playing computers, or perhaps more accurately would be saying uh, game playing algorithms, mm -hmm. predated the examples you listed um, mm. as a computers with internal models. Mm. Still, you didn't <coughs> mention those. Is there mm. a particular reason why you didn't? Um, I guess I should have mentioned them. Um, you're quite right. I mean, the. Uh, 
what I'm thinking of here is, is particularly robots with, with um, explicit simulations of, the, of themselves and the world. So I was limiting my examples to simulations of themselves and the world. I mean, you're quite right that, of course, you know, game-playing algorithms need to have a simulation of the game, um, and quite likely of the, in fact, certainly of, of the possible moves of the, the, the opponent, as well as, you know, the as it were, the, the game playing AI's own moves. So you're quite right. I mean, it's a, it's a different kind of simulation, but, but, but I should include that. You're right, yeah. yeah. Hi there. Hi. Uh, in your simulation, you had the H robot with one goal and the A robot with a different goal. Mm -hmm. And they interacted with each other halfway through the goals. What happens when they have the same goal? The same goal, um, reaching the same spot, for, for example. I don't know. Uh, is right. the short answer. Um, okay. The if it depends on whether that spot is uh, is a safe spot or not. I mean, if it's a safe spot, then um, they'll both go toward it. They'll both reach th reach it, but but without crashing into each other, because the the A robot will will make sure that it avoids the the H robot. In fact, that's more or less what's happening in the corridor experiment. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But it's a good question. We should try that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The simulation that he did for the corridor experiment, right? Uh, the actual real world experiment. Did the simulation uh, track? the other robot's movements as well, meaning what information did the simulation have that it be began with versus what did it perceive? Because, I mean, the other robots are moving, and in the real world, they might not move as you predict them to be. Yeah. How yeah. does the <coughs> blue robot, how did the blue robot actually know for each step where the other robots were? Sure, sure. Um, that's a very good question. I mean, we, in fact, we cheated it, cheated in the sense that we used, for the real robot experiments, we used um, a tracking system uh, which means that the that, that essentially uh, the the robot with an internal model has uh, has access to the position. It's like a GPS internal GPS system. So, um, but in a way, that's really just a kind of um, uh, you know it, it's it's kind of cheating. But but even a robot with a vision system would be able to track all the robots in its field of vision and. And as for the second part of your question, um, our kind of model of what the other robot would do is very simple, which is it's a kind of ballistic model, which is if a robot is moving at, in a, at a particular speed in a particular direction, then we assume it'll continue to do so until it encounters another, a, a, an, an obstacle. So, um, so very simple kind of, if you like, ballistic model, which, you know, even for humans, is useful for, for very simple behaviors like, you know, moving in a crowded space. Yeah. Hello. Oh, hi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, in the same experiment, uh, the in the, it's a continuation of the previous question. So in between, some of the red robots have changed their direction randomly, I guess so. Uh, does the internal model of the blue robot consider that? Um, not explicitly, but it but it it, in, it does in the sense that because it's um, pre or reinitializing its internal model every half a second, then if the positions and directions of the of the actors in its environment have changed, then that they will reflect the new positions. Uh, so not exactly the positions, but uh, as you said, you have considered the ballistic motion of the objects. Mm -hmm. So if there is any randomness in the environment, so does the internal model of the blue robot consider the randomness and change the view of the red robot? It's like it views the red robot as a mm -hmm. ballistic motion. Mm -hmm. So does it change its view of the red robot, that red robots move in the ballistic motion? Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, no, it's a very good question. I, I, I think the answer is no. I think we're probably um, assuming a, a more or less deterministic uh, model of the world. Um, 
deterministic, yes, I think, I think pretty much deterministic, but, but we're relying on the fact that we are uh, updating and rerunning the model, reinitializing and rerunning the model every half a second to, if you like, track the stochasticity, which, which is inevitable in, in the real world. Um, we probably do need to introduce st some stochasticity into the internal model, yes, but, uh, but not yet. Yeah. Thank you. But good, very good question. Hello. Um, with real-life applications Hi. with this technology, like driverless cars, for example, mm. Mm. Um, I think it becomes a lot more important uh, how you program the robot, yeah. right, in terms yeah. of ethics. Yeah. So, I mean, there could be dile like dilemmas like, you know, if there's, um, the robot has a choice between saving a school mm. bus full of kids versus mm. one driver, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that yeah. logic needs to be programmed, right? Sure. Uh, and you made a distinction between um, being an engineer yourself and then ha being an ethicist earlier. Mm. Mm. So to what extent um, is the engineer responsible in that case? Yeah. And also, um, does, a pro does, does a project like this in real life always require an ethicist? How do you um, see this field in real life applications evolving? Sure, now that's, that's a really great question. Um, I mean, you're right that, that driverless cars, you know, will, uh, well, it's, it's debatable whether they will have to make such decisions, um, but, but many people think they will have to make such decisions, which are kind of, you know, the, the driverless car equivalent of the trolley problem, which is a, a well-known kind of ethical dilemma um, thought experiment. <coughs> now, um, my view is that uh, the rules will need to be decided not by the engineers but but if you like by the whole of society um, so ultimately the the rules that decide how the the, the driverless car um, should behave under under you know these difficult circumstances impossible in fact circumstances even and and even if we should in fact program those rules into the car so so you know some people argue that that, that driverless cars should not you know, attempt to, as it were, uh, make a rule-driven decision, but just, but just leave it to chance. And again, that, I think that's an open question. But this is really why I think the, this dialogue, you know, and, and debate uh, and conversations with, with regulators, uh, lawyers, um, ethicists, and, and the general public, you know, users of driverless cars, I think it's why we need to have this debate. Because whatever those rules are, and even whether we have them or not, is something that, that, that should be decided, as it were, collectively. Um, I mean, someone asked me uh, last week, um, should you be able to alter the ethics of your own driverless car? My answer is absolutely not. No, I mean, that should be illegal. So I think that, that if driverless cars were to have a set of rules, and especially if those rules had numbers associated with them, um, I mean, you know, let's think of a, of a less emotive example. Imagine a driverless car um, and uh, a, a, an animal runs a, into the road. Well, uh, the driverless car can either um, uh, ignore the animal and definitely kill the animal, or it could try and brake, um, possibly causing harm to the driver or the passengers, uh, but effectively reducing the probability of killing the animal. So there's an example where you have some numbers, you know, to, 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 to tweak, if you like, parameters. So these, you know, if these rules are built into driverless cars, they'll be parameterized. And I think it should be absolutely illegal to um, hack those parameters, to change them. Um, you know, in the same way that's Ill probably illegal right now to, to hack uh, an aircraft autopilot. I suspect that probably is illegal, but uh, <laughs> if it isn't, it should be. So, so I think that you know you don't need to go far down this this kind of line of argument before realizing that 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 regulation and legislation, uh, you know, has has to come into into play. In fact, I saw a piece in uh, this just this morning, I think, on in Wired, um, um, that I think in the U.S. Uh, uh, regulation for driverless cars is now on the table, yeah, which is absolutely right. I mean, we, you know, we, we, uh, we need to have regulatory frameworks or what I call governance frameworks for 
uh, for driverless cars and in fact lots of other autonomous systems, not just driverless cars, but great question, thank you. So in the, in the experiment with the corridor, you always assume, even in the other experiments, you always assume that the main actor is the most intelligent and all the others are not, like they are dumb or like they are ballistic models or linear models. Have you tried doing a similar experiment in which still like the, each, each uh, actor is intelligent but assumes that the others are not, but actually everyone is intelligent? So like everyone is a blue dot in the, in the experiment with the, with the model that you have? And also have you considered changing the model so that it assumes that the others have the same model that that particular actor has as well? Which obviously complicates yeah. simulation. No, um, we're doing it right now. Uh, so that's, we're doing that experiment right now. Um, and, you know, if you asked me back in, an, in a year, perhaps I could tell you what happened. I mean, it, it's, it's really mad because it's, you know, but it does take us down this direction of, of uh, theory of mind, artificial theory of mind. So, so, you know, if you have several uh, robots or actors, each of which is modeling the behavior of the other, um, then, uh, you know, you, you, you get, I mean, some of the... Um, I don't even I don't even have a movie to show you, but but in simulation we've 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 tried this where we have um, two robots which are kind of like imagine you you know this happens to all of us you're walking down the pavement and you and and you and you do the sort of sidestep dance you know with someone who's coming towards you and so the research question that we're asking ourselves is do we get the same thing and it seems to be that we do. So if, if the robots are symmetrical, you know, in other words, they're, they're each modeling the other, then we can get these kind of little interesting you know, dances uh, where uh, each is trying to get out of the way of the other, but, but in fact choosing, in a sense, the opposite. So one chooses step right, the other chooses step left, and they're still, they still can't go past each other. But it's, it's hugely interesting. Yes, hugely interesting. Hi, um, hello. Yeah, I think it's really interesting how you point out the importance of simulations and internal models. Um, but I feel that one thing that is slightly left out, there's a huge gap from going mm. from simulation to real world robots, for example. Mm. And mm. I assume that in these simulations, you kind of assume that the sensors are 100% reliable. Mm. Mm. And that's obviously not the case in yeah. reality. Yeah. And especially yeah. if we're talking about autonomous cars yeah. or robots and safety. Yeah. Um, how do you calculate the uncertainty that comes with these sensors in the equation? Sure. I mean, no, this is a deeply interesting question. And, and the short answer is I don't know. I mean, this is, this is all future work. Um, we, uh, I, I mean, my instinct is that, I, is that a robot with a, sen with a simulation, internal simulation, even if that simulation um, in a sense is ide idealized is still probably going to be safer than a robot that has no internal simulation at all and and you know i think we humans have multiple simulations running all the time so i think we have sort of quick and dirty kind of low fidelity simulations when we need to move fast um, but but clearly, you know, when you need to, to plan something, plan some complicated action, then, um, you know, like, like where you're going to go on holiday next year, you don't use this, clearly don't use the same internal model, same simulation, as for when you, know, you try and, and, and stop someone from running into the road. Um, so I think that um, future intelligent robots will need also to have multiple simulators and also um, strategies for choosing which, which fidelity simulator to use at a particular time. Um, and, and if a particular situation requires that you, you need higher fidelity, then, then um, for instance, one of the things that you could do, which actually I think humans probably do, is that you simply move more slowly to give yourself time, or even stop to give yourself time to figure out what's going on. And, and, and in a sense plan your strategy. So, so I think, um, you know, even with, with computational power, the, the computational power we have, there will still be a limited simulation budget. And I suspect that that simulation budget will mean that in real time, when you're doing this in real time, uh, you probably can't run your, your highest fidelity simulator and taking into account all of those, you know, 
probabilistic, um, you know, noisy, uh, noisy um, sensors and, and actuators and so on, you probably can't run that simulator all the time. So, you know, I think we're going to have to have a nuanced approach where we have perhaps multiple simulators with, mu with multiple fidelities or maybe a, a sort of tuning where you can tune the fidelity of your simulator. Um, so this is kind of a new area of research. I don't know anybody who's thinking about this yet, apart from ourselves. So great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is pretty hard, yes, I think. Yeah, yeah. Please. Do you want the microphone? Uh, yeah, sorry. Have you considered this particular situation where there are two Asimov robots, and that would be an extension of the question that he asked? Mm. Uh, so, for example, like if there are two guys wo uh, walking on a pavement, and there could be a possibility of mutual cooperation, as in mm. one might communicate to other that I might st step out of this place and you might go, and then I'll mm. go after that. So, if there are two Asimov robots, will there be a possibility, and have you considered this fact that? both will communicate with each other and they will eventually come to a conclusion that I will probably walk and the other might like get out of the way. Mm. And the second part of this question would be, what if one of the robots actually, uh, I mean, does not agree to cooperate? I mm. mean, since they both would have different simulators and mm. they could have different simulators and one might actually try to communicate that you yeah. step out of the way yeah. so that, uh, yeah. I mean, I might go forward yeah. and the yeah. other one doesn't agree with that. Have yeah. you, I mean, what would be the uh, consequence of this? Yes, yeah, good question. In fact, we've, we've, we've actually got a, a new paper which we're just uh, writing right now um, and the, the sort of working title is The Dark Side of Robot Ethics. <laughs> or should, I'm sorry, no, The Dark Side of Ethical Robots. Um, and, and uh, you know, one of the things that we've discovered, it's actually not surprising, is that you only need to change one line of code to, to, uh, for a, a cooperative robot to become a, a competitive robot or even an aggressive robot. Um, so that, that you know, it, it's fairly obvious when you, when you start to think about it. If, if your ethical rules are very simply written, and are a kind of layer, if you like, on top of the, the rest of the architecture, then it's not that difficult to change those rules. Which, um, and, and yes, we've done some experiments, and I, again, I don't have any videos to show you, but, but they're pretty interesting, um, you know, the showing where, um, how easy it is to make, if, it, if you like, a competitive robot, or even an aggressive robot, um, using this approach. Uh, in fact, on the, on the BBC, uh, six months ago or so, I was asked, you know, surely if you can make an ethical robot, doesn't that mean you can make an unethical robot? And the answer, I'm afraid, is yes. Um, it, it, it does mean that. Um, but this really goes back to, to your question earlier, which is that, that it should be, you know, we should make sure it's illegal to, to convert, to turn, if you like, to, to, to recode an ethical robot as an unethical robot. Or even it should be illegal to, to make unethical robots something like that. But it's a great question and um, uh, short answer, yes. Uh, and, and yes, we have some interesting new results and a new paper um, on, as it were, unethical robots. Mm. Yeah. All right, we are running out of time now. Uh, thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, thanks Professor Alan Winfield. Thank you. Uh, for thank you very much. Thank you.